year one, hard as it is to believe the football season is upon us. Tim, I'm not quite sure how it got here this fast, but uh, you are going back over to alma mater, and I have a feeling that this may not be, um, shall we say, the, the time you wanted to go back, but uh, you got a good team to go back with. Well, we've got a senior-laden football team. We've got 24 seniors, and one of two things can happen. We can be really, really good and maybe go to the promised land, and we can be really, really bad and not ever even get to even take a glimpse of the promised land. Uh, you know, but I think our football team is headed in the right direction. We want to play Auburn, a great football team uh, with a great football tradition against a great football coach. And our kids are going, our kids are excited about going to Auburn and playing football. They have, um, they have been in front of big crowds like this before, but we have a quarterback this year that is literally going to be thrown into the breach. Sure, he is. And, uh, you know, any one of the three that would have been the starting quarterback would have been thrown into the breach to start with anyway. You know, in the past, when we played Florida State, when we played Florida, you know, our kids didn't really realize that, hey, these guys put their pants on just like everybody else does until maybe midway through the first quarter, midway through the second quarter. And then they found out, and then it was almost too late, late at that time. But I think our kids are going to realize that, hey, we can play with Auburn. Uh, we, they understand it's a David and Goliath situation, though. They understand we got to take that smooth stone out of beautiful Eagle Creek. And all right, we're going to get one shot. It's got to be a bullseye. And if it's a bullseye, we win. <laughs> going back home has to be some, some great feelings for you and, and, and a, a great experience. Well, I'm going back home, you know, where I met my wife and I got two degrees and I played football and all those type of things. Got my first start as a college football coach. But really, I don't have to block anybody, thank goodness. <laughs> I don't have to tackle anybody. I can't catch. I never could catch anyway. Uh, you know, our kids are going to play, and I just happen to be responsible to, for making good decisions and leading them in the right direction. We're going to get them out there and let them play and let them have fun, let them have a good time. It's really not Tim Sauer versus Coach Pat Dye. It's Auburn, Auburn University versus Georgia Southern University. Great way to start the 91 season. We'll see you soon. I think it's a good time. I think it's a good time to play Auburn. I really do. All right. And we'll see you with the highlights, the first half highlights of the Auburn-Georgia Southern game after we pause for this. Although it still feels very much like summer, the country's mood is turning toward football. Georgia Southern and Auburn began the season late Saturday afternoon at Jordan-Hare Stadium with the traditional coin toss that Auburn won. The Tigers elected to receive, and the season was underway. David Cool, who now handles the kickoff chores as well for the Eagles, began the 91 festivities by kicking the ball right out of the end zone. The Tigers didn't exactly get off to a rip-roaring start. On second and ten, tailback Joe Frazier got three when Paul Sickley stopped the proceedings. And on third and seven, quarterback Stan White gave it to Herbert Casey on a reverse. Moultrie sophomore Darius Dawson and Rodney Oglesby dropped him for zero gain. Kevin Whitley adding the punctuation. And the Southern minority approved. Lo and behold, the Tigers had to punt. Terry George boomed it 40 yards downfield, where Rodney Oglesby returned it for a mere four yards, but the Eagles started with great field position at their own 41. Georgia Southern's offense took the field for the first time, and the first play from scrimmage with a brand-new freshman helmsman named Charles Bostic was a quarterback draw that netted six yards. On second down, fullback Lester Eifert matched Bostick's numbers with a half dozen of his own and into Auburn territory for a first down. Eifert got the call again and responded with another seven yards. And moments later, on a second and 13 call, Bostick dropped back and hit slot back Don Hudson with the Utah pass that turned into a 17-yard gainer down to the Auburn 23 and the Eagles were suddenly looking in mid-season form. Then on second and eight from the Tiger 21, Bostick rolled left for 11 yards, another first down, and scattered sideline photographers in the process. The Auburn partisans continued to watch in stunned disbelief as Mr. Bostick pulled off that nifty little draw again and down on that part of the field where yardage is supposed to be the toughest to come by. Charles was making it look more like a Sunday stroll as he got to the one.
And it didn't matter that a second down play got nothing. When on third and goal, Bostic again called his own number. Rolled right toward the Eagle faithful and into the end zone. While the Southerners were going berserk, Auburn fans were thinking they'd just tuned into the Twilight Zone. Was it possible they'd not gotten a first down and Georgia Southern already had six? Uh, make that seven points with David Cool's PAT? Meanwhile, Stan White and the rest of the Tiger offense still couldn't crack the Eagle defense. After their initial first down of the evening, White couldn't find a receiver, nor could he find much running room on this play either. But Auburn fans just knew their team would come to life. And so it seemed on their second series, now operating from the Eagle 38. Joe Frazier hit the right side for five more yards up toward the Southern 30. But it was slim pickets from there. Hinesville's Ronald Johnson stopped Reed McMillan after only a yard. And on third and six, a counter to Frazier netted exactly zilch. So the Tigers sent in Jim Von Weil to try a 46-yard field goal. And darn those narrow goal posts, Von Weil was off by a mile. Southern, however, failed to move and had to punt it right back to the Tigers. But they didn't have it very long. On first down from their own 19, Stan White pitched to Darrell Williams when freshman linebacker Paul Carroll forced Williams to fumble. Michael Berry recovered, and the Eagles were in business at Auburn's 18, while Southern fans were seriously depleting the oxygen supply. Things were going so well for the Eagles, in fact, you'd have thought University President Dr. Nick Henry had written this script himself. We caused a lot of their mistakes, and that kept us sky high the first half. Everybody was rolling, the offense was moving the ball, the defense was stopping them, and, you know, our intensity was just unbelievable. They were, you know, they were really super fired up in the first half. Uh, during the week, I made it a point, you know, not to really get them sky high about this football game. I just told them we were going to play Auburn. I knew when they came to the stadium on Friday that when they got here and saw the magnitude of the stadium that we were in Auburn and they recognized the stadium that they seen on TV, I knew they would really hit them home at that time. I didn't, I didn't want to be tight, and they weren't tight. They were, they, they were loose and they were ready to play football. And we came out here and, and gave it a good shot. But once again, we can't be satisfied with a good shot. But there's a lot of positive things that happen and that we can really build on. And I appreciate our kids' effort. I really do. You know, I think we came out with our heads on a level, even kill, you know. I think we felt pretty good coming in. We are real satisfied with our plan that we had put in. And I think the guys just came out ready to play, you know. You executed so well. Uh, you certainly didn't look like a brand new freshman in that plan in front of 80,000 people. Well, I think I, you know, really just play within my teammates on the most part. You know, my offensive line, you know, probably one of the outstanding offensive lines in Division One AA. And, you know, I just came out and just played my game at first, and, you know, some things worked out for me. Yes, I think one could say things worked out for Charles. Moving behind that hard-charging offensive line, Lester Eford bulldozed his way for six yards to the Auburn 12 as the first quarter ticked into history. Then on the second quarter, second play, Bostick worked his way down to the Auburn two. Unfortunately, it was now fourth down, and David Cool was called on to put the Eagles 10 points ahead. Just a chip shot for David, but remember, the goalposts are much narrower this year. David came through, however, as usual. While the defense continued to give the Tigers fits, Stan White avoided the clutches of Curtis Gordon, only to meet Michael Berry on the other side. Stan continued to be plagued by the rush. Even though he completed this pass, he paid the price as Ronald Johnson decked him immediately, and the War Eagles had to punt to the Eagles at war. Despite good field position, Southern couldn't muster a drive. This pitch to Lester Eford was one of the few times that the option worked very well Saturday night. So the Eagles were forced to punt it right back, and new punter Don Norton came on to do the job. And what a sensational job he did on his first night. Thomas Bailey fielded it with no problem at the other end, but on the return, he tried to step over Southern linebacker Mel McBride and forgot to take the football with him. 
not recommended in the new coach's handbook of do's and don'ts on punt returns. And although it took a while to untangle this mess at the bottom of the pile, when all was said and done, Shane Maxwell had come up with it for Georgia Southern at the enemy 22. On first down, Charles Bostic rolled left, cut back to his right, and picked up eight yards. Then the pitch to Lester Eford on the left corner. Lester broke a tackle, got four yards, and a first down to the Tiger two. Bostic made it look like child's play from there. On first and goal, Darrell Hopkins got to carry the mail, and neither rain nor snow nor sympathy for Coach Pat Dye and company would keep Darrell from his appointed rounds to the end zone. The Eagles led 17-0, 17-3 at halftime. And we'll be back with our halftime guest, strength coach George Smith, after this timeout. Our first half, as if the two teams had swapped uniforms at halftime, so much was the contrast in their respective performances. Southern took the opening kickoff and proceeded to go nowhere fast. Quarterback Charles Bostic losing two yards on a second down play and then missing his target altogether on the next. But when the Tigers got their hands on the football, they were awesome. Reed McMillan, a sophomore fullback, began the first of numerous seemingly unstoppable runs with this 18-yard carry through the middle. Then the Tigers went cherry-picking. Pedro Cherry, that is, as Stan White faded a pass and fired a 40-yard rainbow that put the Tigers down at the GSU 23. Senior cornerback Kevin Whitley out of Decatur, who'd been burned on the last play, did have one shining moment in the drive when he broke up this pass intended for Thomas Bailey at the nine. But it only prolonged the inevitable. And the inevitable arrived on the next flight. White's perfect 23-yard strike to Herbert Casey in the end zone that made it 17 to 10. But one could somehow just sense the change in attitude, momentum, and the 70,000 who were not pulling for Georgia Southern. Well, I think second half, um, we were excited to be ahead, and when we came out, um, I don't know, it was, it was just like, you know, they came out, they was a different team, but, you know, I think we thought we had the game one at halftime, we had another two um, quarters to play, so. And like in going to four quarters, we still up by one point, we still could have won it, but we just got to, you know, get better and play four quarters, four quarters and win it for us. I didn't really notice, you know, one particular thing, it's just that it started gradually, you know, they scored coming out, and then the crowd got back into the game, and. They just started rolling after that. We couldn't get the ball moving and defense couldn't stop me. So, you know, I don't think it was just one thing. I just think that it gradually came along. And come along it did. Late in the third stanza, White had the Tigers on the prowl again, threading this needle to tight end Fred Baxter for nine yards. And on first and 15 from the Southern 25, a quick give to Joe Frazier, netted six around the left side. Then it was McMillan again, showing the Eagles another weapon in his arsenal pass catching and then bulldozing. 11 yards down to the eight, and four more were tacked on for a personal foul at the end of the play. Two plays later, Frazier crashed into the promised land off left tackle to bring the Tigers within a point. But that was as close as they'd get in this quarter, thanks largely to those new goal posts again. Jim Von Weil was off target once more, and it was the Eagles clinging by a talent to a slim one-point lead. Uh, we were leading them going into the fourth quarter. We just couldn't sustain enough drive, no minimum on offense in the second half. We couldn't put two or three or four or five first downs together in the second half. And, uh, you know, we need we can build on something. This that happened tonight. There's a lot of positive things that happened. There's also a lot of things to work on. Come back and hopefully get back on the winning track next week against Savannah State. Unfortunately for the Eagles, the only thing that changed in the fourth quarter was the direction the Tigers were driving. McMillan for 20 yards, up the gut, to the GSU 15. White then capped off the five-play 42-yard drive with another perfect strike, rolling right and hitting wide open Fred Baxter at the goal line. And for good measure, a two-point conversion pass from Stan to Herbert Casey but it had taken mighty Auburn 
almost two and a half minutes into the fourth chucker before they had finally gotten their first lead of the night, 24-17. Late in the quarter, Southern had fresh blood in at quarterback. Derek McGrady came in to run the offense after Charles Bostic had sustained a slight ankle sprain. And for the moment, Eagle hearts and spirits were lifted when McGrady kept it for nine yards around the left side. But the Eagles had no tricks left up their sleeves on this final day of August. The Tigers' superior strength and depth had finally taken its toll. We, we try not to let, you know, let down or, you know, lose intensity or anything like that, but it's, I think it was more of a shift on their part than on ours. You know, we tried to maintain what we had, and I think they just kind of picked up theirs a little in the fourth quarter. Got thrown into the breach tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't expecting to go in that way, but, you know, I had to be, you know, I was told to be ready. I might go in at any time, and I was just glad to get in the game, and I, you know, wanted to try to get in and make something happen if I could. We came out rolling, you know, the offense. We ready. We was up for it, and we know that they won't have a big cry here, but like I said, we came out. We was ready to play ball, and things just didn't work out for us at the end, but we still fought and fought, and we just going to continue to fight. I'm fine. You know, I sprained my ankle, but um, I'll be back next week for Savannah State. The Tigers punctuated their victory with our old nemesis, Reed McMillan, blasting 32 yards to Pater. And just to add a little salt to the wound, even a broken play on the PAT turned into a two-pointer for the Tigers and the final 15-point margin. And Coach Stowers will have final comments in a moment. 